So we are at Parashat Kitetze. Parashat Kitetze. Uh, it is a parashat that has the most mitzvot in it. Especially mitzvot that says the most mitzvot in it. And it is maybe the most special parashat in the Torah. <laughs> Why? Because it's my, my bar mitzvah parashat, so you can't get any better than that. So, by the way, this is not my bar mitzvah dvar Torah. I don't think, I don't remember what I said. I don't think I said much. Anyway, so the parasha teaches us, starts with a, starts with a war and ends up with a war. Somewhat ends up with a war. I don't know if I will be able to finish the whole thing today. If not, there's at Hashem, there's always tomorrow. But nevertheless, he's teaching us mainly on a, about a war and really the only kind of war that there is out there. Uh, a war that the person, like any other war, but especially this one, you have to go out to this world, to this world, war, with one thing in mind, is to win. If you're going to a war to lose, don't go to a war. And especially right before... Uh, right before Rosh Hashanah, the Torah and this parasha tries to show us how to do an internal balance and to show us what is the victory, what is the goal in which we all try to strive for. So one needs to understand, you know I love military history and so on and so forth, so uh, it was very hard for me not to go and to analyze it from a, uh, a historical military point of view, but you know I'll try to do my best to behave. So wars are one of the one of the things that Am Israel is unfortunately accustomed to uh, from the very beginning of the existence of Am Israel. Uh, right, of course, right after we came out of Mitzrayim. We just became a nation, war with Amalek. Boom, right away. I mean, it's very interesting that the same thing for the modern state of Israel, as soon as it became the modern state of Israel, that day started what? A war against our own Amalek of our, of our generation. Uh, and this was the share of Am Israel throughout, the, throughout history. Very interesting to me that the Jews are never referred to as warriors, yet they had to deal with wars from the very beginning until nowadays. Every, I mean, it's, this is even to make the, the miracle of the Jewish existence even more miraculous. And I'm telling you that, first of all, because, okay, I'm sidetracking. I told you, it's hard for me to behave. But... I need to tell you that the Jews are tough people. And that attitude of this uh, Jew, the goes like this, the weak Jew, the weakling Jew, is something that the Goyim had tried to implant into our minds that we should that we are weak and we are not this and so on and so forth. The Jews always fought a nation of warriors. And I dare to say that there isn't a nation on earth today that had dealt with wars for so many thousands of years. Maybe it's about time to start realizing this again. Hello, where you been? Hope we won't go to get breakfast again. And with something is that we should start to realize that. And it's very interesting you just came in because, you know, as a Tuvia, you would have understand this, uh, you would appreciate it, but, you know, I guess you have to catch it on Torah anytime. Uh, but we know that in every, any, like any other event in the world, and one needs to remember, there is an external aspect to it and there is an internal aspect to it. Everything is combined of both. Spiritual and the physical aspect to it. 
And the Kabbalah tells us that the wars, or wars against a physical enemy, are always an expression to battles and wars that happen inside of each and every one of us as individuals and as a body and as this big thing that's called the Jewish nation. Once told, once someone told me, he said, everything that we, every time we, there's an enemy that comes upon us, it hits us in a different manner. So if you understand, if you want to understand why did you get whacked now, look at the way you did it and you understand what you need to learn from it. And the way that war was executed to us. And you learn a lesson at your current state and what you should fix. And we can sit here and we can analyze from today for the past 500 years, at least, if not more. And you'll see that every time we got a whack, it was because of our condition. And you'll see that it's so... Uh, you want, I'll just give you an example. The Spanish Jews thought that they are an integral part of the Spanish society. And they this and they that and so on and so forth. Came the Spanish people and they vomited them out of Spain. You're not one of us. Expelled. Well, in 1967, the Jewish need, people needed to be put together. They won the war. Great victory. It was a great miracle. Hashem helped us. Hashem always helps us. Always. The, some people want to call it the sitra hara, the, the, the wicked side, the bad side. It has no ability whatsoever. It's only HaKadosh Baruch who has the power to do anything in this world. 1973, we were arrogant. We were vain. What happened? The Egyptians, the Syrians attacked us. It hurt. We won. We paid the price. We, be, we build big fortresses. We thought that they can't, that they aren't penetrated, they can't penetrate them. Came the Egyptians with like kids. Kids played it. They took water, high pressure water, put down the dunes, the ramps, and went right in. Where there is a suicide bomber that comes and blows himself up and blows us into smithereens. Why? Because we're not united. Hello, wake up. This is how it's been executed. You want to look at, uh, at the Holocaust? The Jews were fragmented. They didn't see themselves as a nation, as one body. They had statuses. Elite, not elite, intellectuals, not. They were fragmented. Just like Haman told us. And I see we're not going to get us to this tonight. Came this Tsoreri Machimo, Hitler Harasha. And he taught us a lesson. I said, You saw yourself all separated? Look, you're all the same. When you come out of the chimneys of smoke, you're all the same. When they took the ashes, look at the ashes. There's a pile in Maidanic, places like this, in Auschwitz. There are piles of ashes, of, of bodies, of Jews that burnt. Mounds. You cannot tell a, an Admor from a robber, an intellectual from a, from a, from a, from a, from a, you know, illiterate. You can't tell. You can't tell a righteous from a wicked. We're all the same. We didn't want to understand that. So we got a rude awakening. Every generation is like that. And it doesn't fail. It says in the Zohar that some of the masters of the, of, of the Kabbalah and the Chachamim were walking in the way and they met few heroes that came back from a war. So they asked them, where are you coming from? So they said, we're coming from a war. So they laughed. The Chachamim left and they said, your war did not begin yet. The real war is ahead of you. 
the real war waits to each and every one of us at home. And his nefesh in the primiyut. And remember what we learned this morning, Hashem Yishmot Setcha Uvoecha Me'ata Ve'Allah HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to guard you both when you're coming, going out on departure and on arrival. Because when you come home, you have to deal with these things inside. There is a war going in each and every one of us inside. At any given moment, there is a chance of us to do the right or the wrong thing. And that struggle is happening all the time. But I'm going to tell you the following. Unless you get, as they say, history is written by the winners. If you're not going to write history, if you're not going to write your path, eventually you're going to lose. By the way, everybody knows, anyone knows, what, which case is it? Only one case in history. That history was written by the losers, not by the winners. I mean, what I mean by history written by the winners? For example, if you... Uh, if you would, uh, we talked before about this Rasha Hitler, right? So we write the way Hitler was and what happened to him, and how wicked it was, and so on and so forth. God forbid Hitler would have won. We would not, history would not be written that Hitler was a wicked man, and so on and so forth. That would glorify his acts, right? Which case in history was written by the losers? And dictated by the losers? I'll tell you that. The history that is being written right now about the Israeli-Palestinian crisis, about the Jewish-Arab conflict. The Jews always won, the Arabs always write the history. In 1967, there was no such thing as a Palestinian state, nor a Palestinian nation. It was a part of Jordan. They lost, and they write the history. Do you know why? Because we let them. Now, and Lema said, to, to practically speaking, until you did not fight the internal battle, your external enemies are going to come and knocking on your door and fight you from generation to generation until Am Israel is not going to be able to win the battle internally, we're always going to have external enemies. If you want your own battle inside, you have nothing to worry about, because then Shem Hashem is imprinted on you. And then nobody, no nation, no, no one can oppress you. Because there's Shem Hashem on you. There is a sign of a covenant on us. But when we hide it, it's nowhere to be seen. And then the enemies come. So the parasha says, that if you would go, if and when you will go to a war on your enemies, unetano Hashem elokecha beyadecha veshavita shivyo. And Hashem will help you. And then you're going to have POWs. And you saw a pretty lady, pretty woman, walking down the street. Right? Pretty woman, the one you like to meet. Right? And you desired her. And you took her for a wife. Rashi explained to us what is Eshet Yefat Torah? He says, Lo dibra Torah, ela The Torah did not speak against, when he says Eshet Yefat Torah, was not talking about a woman, was talking about your Yetzer Hara. Yetzer Hara, what we said before Yetzer Hara is, this week, earlier this week, what, how do we define Yetzer Hara? Formation of bad. Your own formation of bad, right? 
And it says, and it says, Rashi says, on a yetzer, on your desire that is awakened in a woman when he sees a, a pretty woman in the battlefield. But more than that, what, it's, what it seems to clarify from his words is that going to the war in which we're talking about into the parasha is, it's, is the only war you go against or you go out to. Ki titzele milchama al oivecha. That you will go to a war on your enemy. And if the enemy, according to Rashi, is the Yetzer Ara, that's the only war I'm going to. In other words, all the other wars that I would have to face are a derivative of my Yetzer Ara inside. Because if you're doing what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants from you, and you are directing yourself, and you're putting them on the path in which He asks you to do, there's never going to be a war. There's no reason for a war. But why there is a war? Because you cannot overcome your Yetzer Hara. You are forming bad. Every person that was born in this world, every person, there is a battle waiting for him against his own private yetzer, his own private urges. And this parasha comes especially in Chodesh Elul, at the beginning of Chodesh Elul. Why? That there's still time for us to give an account on all the things that we lost all our, all our lost battles and all our victories. That, we are not talking about business. We're talking about in the battlefield of your spirituality inside. This parasha comes to, te- to give us the koach, the strength, the wisdom to strengthen ourselves, to pull ourselves back together to overcome that challenge that we have and what we call al-nekudat hara the point of bad everything starts from a point there is a point in which everything starts from I really didn't realize how long it's going to take us I don't think I'm going to finish it even tomorrow still, what does it mean? let's say for example let's take a person who is Mechalel Shabbat he keeps Shabbat but two years from now, you're going to walk in the street and you're going to see him on Shabbat uh, smoking a Cuban cigar and driving a car and, and eating a, I don't know, a McBacon, whatever it is, you know, one of those things. And he says, Makaralecha, what happened to you? All of a sudden? No, no, no. It's not all of a sudden. Something starts from a point. And then it grows through negligence and it grows and becomes what it becomes. I'll give you an example. You're driving your car and it's a snowy day. And comes the plow. And they plow it and there comes the salt uh, trucks. And there's some pebbles in the street on, on the road. A guy in front of you drives and he drives fast and all you hear like bang, 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 ticks like this. You come home, you check. Nothing on the hood. But if you look carefully, the surface is already dented. There's some microscopic chips in the paint. Ah, It's nothing. Don't make a big deal out of it. You look at the same spot a year from now, you'll see that the chip, the paint chip there. You'll come 10 years from now, there's rust. You come another 10 years, there's a hole. Things don't just happen. There's a point in which everything starts. If you're going to track yourself back, you, right now you're in a certain situation, and you track yourself back, and he says, you'll be able to pinpoint to that moment in your life in which you made the decision to do this or to do that. Pinpointed. That's called the Nekuda. And there is so-called Nekudat Hara. 
the bad point in which everything stems from. Now, just want to tell you something. Ra is also initials of something. Ra is the initials also of Ratzon Atzmi. Ratzon Atzmi, there is your own self will. That doesn't mean that you don't have to have any wills and wishes. But those selfish ones. So Nekudat Hara, the core, the source of all evil, is the point that you decided that you would be selfish. That's the source, as we said it before, well, I think we have a lecture on that even. The source of all evil is selfishness. And a society that is a bad and dysfunctional society is a society in which selfishness is written all over its flag. A society that doesn't give from itself. And of course, that is the end of a society. Even if it will take 500 years ago, from, from now, I'm sorry. The end started now because that's the core of it. And now it's just a matter of time until it goes. Five years, 500 years, but it's already there. The end, it's, it's a finish, it's a done deal. So comes here the Torah and tells us, listen, this is the time of Rosh Hashanah. This is the time where the world was created to symbolize to us a rejuvenation, a process of renewal. Listen, there is hope. You can still fix it. Go, go to one of those car shops and get some wax and clean it up and, and touch it up so it won't be so bad. But you neglect it. Because you're selfish. And you say, why should I? Bishvilma. In order to win the war, you need to touch the point in which everything came from. Because this is, your, this is the point in which you failed last time. So unless you're going to be able to look into this point and to derive the consequences to learn from it, you're going to fail again. You're going to fail again. And again, and again, and again, until the end of the line, you are a failure. Gamu, complete. A helpless loser. Because you neglected to look at the core of the problem thing. You were just too selfish. And that's, a, that's something you got to fix. Now, if we look at the words, Ki titze la milchama al oivecha, Ki titze, which starts the parasha, the remez, it really hints us, that is on the, on the, on the spiritual uh, character of, of reality. Because the, the Pasuk could have said, Ki ti lachem be oivecha, if you would go to, if you're going to fight your enemy, he doesn't say, Kiti lachem, you're going to go to fight. Kiti tzela milchama, because you would go to a war. But the dagesh, the emphasis, is on the yetzia, on going out. First of all, it's milchemet reshut, ki, if. In other words, even on your internal battle, to become a moral person, to become a better person, Listen, you want to, you want to, you don't want to. Of course, listen, there is a price to pay. Nobody's going to put a gun to your head. That's the beauty of the Torah. We have a free choice. Why do we have a free choice? So you could say that this is my decision, that you would understand this is your decision, that you would not let somebody else make decisions for you, so you could succeed. Because when somebody makes decisions for you, you would fail. Only when you're making your own decisions, you have a chance to succeed. But you need something else to succeed. 
and you need you need a kadosh baruch Hu. Chazal tells us that when we say ki la milchama tetze, the emphasis on yetzia, on departure, on coming out, and that hints us or hints to us on the departure of this world coming, the coming of the neshama to this world. And the neshama comes to this world from its upper source, to this world, in order to execute and to fulfill the mission in which it was given. By whom? By God. I'm going to tell you the following. Let's say, for example, you were born in the Holy Land. And your mission is to spend the rest of your life in a far country helping your fellow Jews. Where the whole world is laughing at you and telling you, what are you doing here? You should go home to Israel. Israel is your homeland. Why are you doing in America? Why are you doing in Australia? Why are you doing here? If you say you're right, I'm going to Israel. I'm leaving everything behind. Did you fulfill your mission? Yes, you got to live in Israel. In the Holy Land. But you left plenty of holes behind you. You need to be in touch with your mission and what you were supposed to do, not what you want to do. The body wants to do one thing, then the shaman knows what it should be doing. Your body wants to have fun, but only girls have fun. The body knows that it needs that pleasure, but the soul knows what is best for us, the body and the soul together. And we need to understand where is it that we're coming out and where is it that we're going. It says in Masechet Abod, Da me'ayim bata, u'le'an ata olech. Not only know where you came from and know where you're going to. That sounds like a Diana Ross song. Do you know where you're going to, right? Where is Smith? He's not here today. He would know that. I wonder where is he. Anyway. He knows where you're coming from. Where you came from. You came from a spiritual world. You came from high above. And where are you going to? Where are you going from this point and on? To where? To Las Vegas? To Atlantic City? Where are you going with this? So it's very nice. It's like a person would say, you know, <coughs> I am a prince. My father is a king. Excuse me. If you're a prince and your father is a king, what are you doing in the corner of the street, you know, putting a heroin into your vein? That's very nice. It doesn't do you any good now, does it? But you should remember. Why well, should remember where I came from so I could align myself on the same place? And I came from a holy place. My neshama came from a holy place. I need to make sure that my direction to follow in this world will follow as much as I can to the best of my abilities that path of holiness as well. And unless you came from a place where they have 72 virgins upon departure, there is no business for any of us to be on porn sites, is it? It's not holy. Since our neshama came from a holy place, when I have nothing else that I have to do, not nothing else to do, that I have to do, I need to be here, here, learning. Not in Las Vegas, not in Fifth Avenue. Not in Louis Vuitton and not in the Michael uh, Albuterol. Nowhere. Here. Why? Because that's the path of my life. When I come here, this is my refueling. 
Otherwise, there's no hope for me outside. How should I tell it to you? You know, like, what's it, uh, you know, the Enterprise, you know, the Starship, you know, what do you call it? Star Trek, no. Star Wars, yeah, you know, right. Scotty, Bimmy Scotty, right? Yes, yeah. You know, there's a lot of Musar to learn from that. That uh, spaceship had a special shield around it, right? That's like this magnetic field that would uh, blow away any kind of incoming missiles or asteroids or whatever it is, right? The same thing here. That's the remes that we get by the mezuzah. That's why Bet Amidrash doesn't need a mezuzah. It is a protection. I'm inside the protection. Ask this yourself next time you're going down to an amusement park. That's what you came here for? To go on a roller coaster? Don't you, didn't you have enough of the roller coaster of your life? Of your life, you need to go on a roller coaster? And we need therefore to understand before you go on the field you need to do some recon. You need to send your special teams your best warriors to give you back intel from the battlefield. What is this battlefield about? What kind of weapons does the enemy have? What kind of formation does it have? I need to analyze the battlefield before I will be able to go to a war. So the recon that I got from the units from a man in the field behind enemy lines is given to me in a codified way. And it says the following, the message says, Halachot Shabbat. We have two rashuyot, two main domains. We have Rashuta Yechid and Rashut Rabim, a public domain and a private domain. And on Shabbat, we have a, in, an Isur, a prohibition, to take things and to remove them from, uproot them from one domain to the other. That's my hint. So the question is, okay, how do I translate it into a language that everybody understands? In Olama Kabbalah, there are, we know, we talk about words, Atzila, Atzila, Atzilud, Bria, right? Yetzira, Hasiya, and so on and so forth. The, the difference between of them is the division between good and bad. How much good, too bad. And Bria, Yetzira, and Asiya, those worlds are called Reshut Arabim. Why? Sheharbe Sholtim Bayim. There are many forces that interact with each other in those worlds. In the in the uh, in Atzilut, right? En Achdut. Kol Echad Leatzmo. And these are Olamot Apirud, right? Reshut Ayachid. Is Rashut is Olam Atzilut, right? On those worlds, right? Everything, everybody is, you know, is it, you know, Atzilut. There's only one thing, one domain. That's called Rashut Ayachid. And Rashut Ayachid, there's that's what the Kedusha is. And in the Halacha, we also have the measurement, the domain in which we'll call a, will be called a private domain. What's the private domain? Arba Amot. Remember? Arba Amot. And height of Tent Fachim. It's very well defined. <coughs> the name Yudke Vavke, Shem Havaya, which is the root of all realities is a name with four letters and is written with four letters but if you pronounce those letters right you would hear also the milui of them which is the yud and the hey and so on and so forth and all together you have ten letters 
that is Rashut HaYachid. Arba al Esa, four by ten, which is the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Rav Scheinberger said that as much as Olama Atzilut is the word which is the closest to the end self, to the, to the infinite, and is the complete unification, so is the Jewish home. The Jewish home is the place, the best place, in which we call Rashuta Yahid, a private domain. And outside of it, it's called Rashuta Rabim, a public domain. And there are a lot of forces there. So the question is asked if on Shabbat I'm not allowed to remove object to uproot from Rashuta Yahid to Rashuta Rabim and vice versa, because of the mixture of Kodesh and Chol between the place of Achdut, unification, Le Makom Shil Ribui Veperud, into a place of separation and fragmentation. Therefore, how could I do that on the weekdays? If I need to make a complete separation between Kodesh Le Chol on Shabbat, why on the rest of the days of the week, I'm not obligated in that. Why on the rest of the week, I'm allowed to do so, take one place to another. For that, you'll have to wait until tomorrow.